Um, welcome back, everybody. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm an associate professor in the MCB department. Um, and yeah, it's really been a pleasure to be here for the last uh, day and meet a lot of you and listen to all the great science. Um, I'm really enjoying this year's neighbor conference. Um, I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, if you don't have an official name tag, there are name tags that you can use uh, that are out in the lobby there. You can write your name on them. They'll be particularly handy during the poster session, um, which is the other announcement I want to make. So coming up after this panel discussion will be a poster session. We have 15 posters. There are sheets like this that I've placed around the lobby and downstairs that list all the poster presenters. If you are not a poster presenter, we need you to go and interact with the poster presenters, okay? And I also have um, feedback sheets. Uh, I have two for each poster, and I'd like to hand those out to people who are not presenting posters so that you can use those to guide some, maybe some informal feedback that you want to give to the poster presenters. Um, and you can also score them and hand the sheets back to me, and we can use these to make some poster awards at the end of the conference. Okay. Um, so I just want to say a couple of brief things uh, about the panel that we're about to have. Um, so yesterday in Alexis Stranahan's really nice keynote address, she showed a graph that on the y-axis had uh, the percentage of PhDs that were being earned by members of a few groups that have been excluded from science in the past. So there were three groups that were highlighted, African Americans, um, sorry, Native Americans, and uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx uh, scientists. And uh, what the graph showed was basically for Native Americans, the, the pace of increase in PhDs earned by members of that group has been really stagnant um, and remains you know, less than 1% of PhDs. Um, Alexis Graph did show some progress um, for Latino, Latina, Latinx, and African American scientists going from about 1 or 2% at the beginning of the graph up to about 3 to 5% now. Um, but there is still a long way to go before US science can really benefit from having every member of our society fully engaged in science. And it really begs the question, what are the things that we in American universities can do to accelerate uh, the pace of change and to see not this like steady, slow increase on those graphs, but a spike. Um, and today, we're gonna have a panel discussion about the University of North Carolina Chancellor's Science Scholars Program, and this is an example of a program that is achieving the kind of results that could result in a spike of representation in science by members of groups that have been excluded in the past. Um, so now what I'm going to do is turn things over to Stacy Lawrence, who is the Senior Associate Director in the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning here at Brown University for STEM initiatives. And Stacy is going to introduce the panelists and moderate our panel discussion, um, which is focused on how scholars programs like the UNC Chancellor's Science Scholars Program can uh, really catalyze culture change at U.S. universities. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you, Mark. All right, so first I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this amazing conference. This is my first time uh, at an Abrit conference despite being at Brown for five years, and I am absolutely thrilled to be hearing the talks and seeing the research that's been represented here uh, over the last two days. I'd also like to thank HHMI for sponsoring this panel discussion. So I'll be your moderator for the next 90 minutes for this hybrid uh, panel discussion, which was actually unplanned, but it's going to be flawless, I bet. Uh, so as Mark mentioned, I'm the Senior Associate Director for STEM Initiatives at the Sheridan Center for Teaching and Learning. I do have a STEM PhD, and I work with instructors to improve the way that they teach science. I'm also, along with Mark, uh, Sylvia Carey Butler, Ron Opair, uh, Rashid Zia and Mary Wright on the HHMI Driving Change Leadership Team that is working collaboratively with 38 other institutions to put forth a proposal or different proposals to study uh, inclusive excellence on our campuses. 
So in 2019, the Howard Hughes Medical Associate Institute uh, announced a new grant competition called Driving Change. The goal of the grant is to drive sustainable culture change on research university campuses so that undergraduate students from all backgrounds, but particularly those who belong to historically excluded groups, will excel in STEM and graduate from college well prepared to pursue advanced degrees and eventually assume leadership roles in STEM. As I mentioned, Brown is one of 38 universities participating in this self-study phase, and we're looking at barriers to historically underrepresented group participation in STEM. We're honored today to have members of UNC's Chancellor Science Scholars Program participate uh, in the panel and to share their experiences transforming UNC. Just to share how we'll spend our time together, I'll give each panelist one minute to introduce themselves. Thomas Freeman, who is joining us virtually, will then share about a five minute overview um, of the program. And then I'll facilitate a conversation with the panelists about their program and then open it up to the audience for questions. If that sounds good with everyone, let's go ahead and get started. So I'll start uh, with the students that are in the space. I'd like for Gabrielle and uh, Kyle to introduce themselves first, and then we'll go on to uh, Thomas online and as well at Richard. Thank you. Hello, okay, hear me? Cool, amazing. Hi everyone, my name is Gabrielle Whiten. Um, I was in cohort number two of the Chancellor Science Scholars, so CSS2. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate at New York University School of Medicine uh, in the pharmacology program, uh, where I study iron metabolism dysregulation in neurodegenerative disease. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? My name is Kyle Shahada Oliveira. Um, I am also a PhD candidate at the University of Maine um, and Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, where I am earning my PhD in marine biology. My work focuses uh, on two parts. So the first part is whether or not environmental DNA is a viable form of detection for white sharks in the Gulf of Maine. And the second part is taking those detections along with more traditional methods of detection uh, to create ecological forecasts and early warning systems for coastal communities in Maine. Am I visible or should I? Can people see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Pardon? Yes, both. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Freeman. I am uh, a teaching professor in the chemistry department at UNC, and I am also uh, blessed with the privilege of being the executive director of the UNC Chancellor Science Scholars Program. Um, I also have, uh, you know, my advanced degree in STEM. I have a PhD in biochemistry, and uh, back when I was an active researcher, studied. Uh, all sorts of things about protein, uh, biophysics, and, and structure. Uh, I'm Rick Superfine. I'm professor of uh, applied physical sciences. I'm also currently chair of the department. And um, I think I'm on the advisory board for the Chancellor Science Scholars Program and uh, have, have really enjoyed learning from Thomas and uh, working with the program at UNC. Awesome, thank you. And so Thomas, you have a brief slideshow that you'd like to share with us, and I think we're ready to see it. Yes, um, I can't guarantee how brief it is, but I definitely have a slideshow <laughs> for you. Um, so I wanted to talk a, a lot about, um, well, a little bit about this, this connection with institutional transformation, and also share some highlights uh, of the program just so you, you all have some, uh, something to think about and aspire to as you pursue your own program uh, there at Brown. So let me make sure I am um, as high as the controls because I bet they're showing up there again. All right. So just really briefly, um, this is just advice for me, and uh, I am not going to give a data-driven set of slides on institutional transformation because we're actually in the midst of conducting a climate study uh, at UNC, and so I, I just don't have the data right now, but I certainly have plenty of anecdotes to talk about the ways that the institution is changing. Um, and Stacey, you were talking about 
you know, how you all, uh, how, how you're involved in helping to improve STEM teaching. Um, and so that's a really important component, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But, you know, the first thing I want to just say is that it's really important for the institution to make sure that you mind your values and how you support them. Um, it's very clear when, you know, what an institution's top priorities are and what their values are um, based on the way that they support them. And so as you think about, you know, trying to be more equitable and inclusive uh, in an effort to support a more diverse climate, a uh, more diverse community, um, make sure that you're committed to supporting that in all the ways that are necessary. Um, that is what's happening at UNC. Um, it's a work in progress. It's not perfect, but we are moving in the right direction uh, in most ways. The news might have you believe otherwise, but, but we are trying to move in the right direction on, on a lot of different fronts, at least the ones that I'm involved in. Um, second thing is or just a reminder that programs that support inclusive excellence are absolutely necessary, but are not sufficient to solve historically entrenched DEI problems. Um, you probably already know that. I'm sure that that's pretty obvious. Um, but sometimes, you know, places will think of programs as solutions, and they're not really solutions per se. They help solve or help to deal with and catalyze a solution to a problem, but they are not the ultimate solution. You know, you have to look at what is going on at the institution and how to really change those, those, those institutional systemic issues and confront them directly. Um, and then the last part of thinking about transformation is, you know, just because you open a space up to historically excluded persons doesn't mean that the space is ready for them. And this really ties to the previous point, which is that you have to be thinking about what were we doing wrong, right? It takes a lot of critical self-reflection and, you know, our experience with HHMI and building this program uh, really shaped their mandate for that in, in program going forward is they really have to look closely at what's going on. And, you know, we did some of that in the beginning, but honestly, you know, thinking about how we started, the institution might not have been deemed ready um, by the current criteria, given what we've learned about how to make sure that the program is well supported from the beginning. Um, so speaking of the beginning, how it started, um, a couple of really important things were happening at UNC at the same time. Uh, there was a really big push to start to reform our pedagogy and our large enrollment in STEM courses because there was a recognition that there were stark, disparate achievement gaps um, for our underrepresented students. And so after uh, a, a big study led by Kelly Hogan and the biology department, um, the university had a wake up call and the Association of American Universities helped sponsor an initiative to help transform pedagogy across all the STEM disciplines. And so chemistry got involved uh, and this was a little bit before I was, I, I actually joined the chemistry department. At the same time, they were looking for programs that were successful models of how do you help train students to get them to make it all the way through, you know, the difficulties of being a STEM major at UNC, and then go on to graduate school. And of course, nothing was more successful than the Meyerhoff program at that time. Um, and so we looked very closely at trying to model what we were going to do after what was going on at the Meyer, at, at UNBC. Um, and there were questions about whether or not any institution could replicate it, right? Because if you don't have a friend of Rabowski was the, the hypothesis, then perhaps you can't actually uh, replicate the success of the Meyerhoff program. And of course, um, several years in a science paper later, we demonstrated resoundingly that you don't have to have a Freeman Rabowski, but you do have to have really committed leadership. And so thinking about the roadmap to inst institutionalization, uh, there are a few key things to keep in mind. First is that you need to have executive and faculty buy-in uh, so you really need to have multiple champions for making sure that all the resources are accessible and that you have all the right um, uh, players and pieces in place in order to get these programs going. So top-level administrators must commit to supporting the program and all of your administrators, or at least enough of them, and faculty should be engaged in DEI efforts and modern pedagogy 
to make sure that the environment is right for a program like this. Um, program model adaptation, of course, this is the next stage where, you know, really being able to uh, put into practice, right, the key elements that make such programs function uh, is critical and, you know, being committed to uh, either implementing directly, so replicating or adapting to your institutional infrastructure, uh, the key components to the Meyerhoff model is going to be really important. Um, and the second piece of that, of course, is having other institutions that are doing the same type of work uh, work alongside you to help help you navigate some of the challenges, the, the many, many, many challenges that you will face in trying to uh, run programs like this. Uh, and then the last thing I really want to emphasize is fundraising. Um, so these programs are extremely expensive. The money that HHMI will give is not enough to run this program long term. Um, you know, and it's really good to have grants to support this work, but ultimately, if this is an important part of your institution, um, I would highly recommend pursuing endowed funds. So really develop this and make it a top institutional fundraising priority. Um, that is what it is at UNC, and I'm happy to report to date that since in the last five years, we've raised about $23 million um, in our endowment. And so we, we, we work really hard to try to make sure that this program is around in perpetuity as this beacon of light and hope. And, you know, we turn out great students like Gabby and Kyle left and right. Um, they come a dime a dozen, no, I'm just kidding. They, they are special. <laughs> um, and so just really quickly a timeline for you. Uh, so this was conceived by the chancellor in 20 and some other faculty in 2011, really started to get off the ground in 2012 and uh, identified our first cohort, CSF1, and started our first program, uh, Summer Bridge. It was not called Summer Accelerated then, that is our current name, but it is a summer transition program that I will uh, tell you a little bit about in a, in a short order. Um, and then the next four years after that, uh, the program experienced a lot of growth and change. So we were put to the College of Arts and Sciences, recruited uh, more cohorts, um, that's around the time when we got a grant from HHMI and our first cohort graduated in 2017 and we got our first endowment of 500,000 at that point in time. So uh, later on, we got a huge grant from uh, the Sherman Fairchild Foundation, $10 million. And uh, that really changed the course of what we could do with the program. Um, more grants that contributed to our endowment um, I'll skip some of this stuff to just sort of take a time. Um, but yeah, so like I said, we've, we've worked really hard over the past five years to, to increase our endowment so that way we could support these amazing scholars. And then just really quickly, some outcomes. So I'm just going to do broad stroke highlights here. I hit the key ones, which is that we've had a lot of students over the past few years um, compared to the rest of the university when National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowships. Um, more than half of our students are in an advanced degree program. So they're either in a PhD program or medical school or dental school or a master's program. Um, and 91% of our graduates remain in a STEM field. So if they don't go directly into a graduate program or professional school, they uh, end up in the STEM workforce. And 71% of our students who go into the STEM workforce directly after graduation, they um, are just doing a gap year before applying to whatever their next destination is. Um, so really high retention. And now I have a short video on the Summer Accelerator and I may not show the whole thing, but I would just want you to get a feel for uh, what it means to start in this program. Nervous, but more like excited just to be here. It's nervous excitement. You know that moment when you're approaching the top of a roller coaster, but you're not quite there yet? You know at some point it's gonna be crazy, but you're not scared yet? It's kind of where I am. So we're here today at Old East with uh, CSS moving in, so the cards are slowly trickling in. It's been a few years. One thing I remember from move-in day was, it was a mixture of like excitedness, nervousness, but I, I was happy to be here. 
Today we are moving in our seventh cohort of scholars. They are coming into their first year at Carolina, their first year as CSS scholars, and they're really going to get acclimated to the program, the university, and everything that's in store for them in the next four years. Four years later, I'm not the one being moved in. I'm actually helping them move in, and this is where it all begins. You're meeting these new people, you're rooming with someone you haven't like met before, but like you're all here for a common purpose. This is the greatest day of the year. These kids actually have no idea what they're getting themselves into. It was a lot at first, but you really get used to it. And the, the program does a good job of transitioning you into the actual school year with this uh, summer program. I am trying to balance wanting him to move forward and um, not having him at home. I'm a 1990 graduate of USC Chapel Hill, so I am pleased that um, he is actually going to matriculate at the same university. This is actually really, really cool. So as we embark on creating the scientists of tomorrow, we're actually housing them in the oldest building ever in public higher education. All that was here when UNC first started was this building right behind the Old East and the Old Well. It's very historic and I just think it's the coolest thing you can do to put tomorrow's minds in like the most amazing historic landmarks that you can find in North Carolina. Okay, I'm gonna stop the video. There, there's a lot more to it as you can see um, and hopefully you'll have access to these, these slides um, so you can check out the rest of that yourself. Uh, there's some really good stuff in there, but... Um, so our summer accelerator program uh, consists of a few different components. We have a communication and a math seminar that are three credit hours each that help students work on developing the math skills and, and, and be prepared for uh, what math is like at UNC. Uh, and the communication is an argument and debate course to help students with crafting arguments, which are really important when you're trying to talk about research and, and defend your ideas. Uh, we also have a supplemental chemistry workshop for one one credit hour. Um, also, again, preparation for you know one of our, our more rigorous and difficult courses for incoming students. Um, they spend a lot of time working on cohort building, as you can see illustrated in the photos to the right. Um, we also have professional development workshops um, to begin to help them begin thinking about what it means to be a, a, a smart, strong, and resilient student. Um, they go on virtual lab tours to get a taste of research at UNC. And then diversity and inclusion workshops begin to start tackling and thinking about those really challenging topics um, that they will face uh, and that people who they work with will face um, as a group. And so all of this is really about thinking about our core values as a program, research experience, community inclusion, academic excellence. Um, and we enforce and try to really help the students develop these pillars of success, which include character, leadership, unity, service, professionalism, and resilience. And all of this is really found, uh, undergirded with, you know, accountability. So we hold the students accountable throughout the entire summer. Um, Kyle, and, Kyle and Gabby can probably tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, but it, it's a really intensive program, and it's what makes a scholar a scholar. You cannot be a chance for science scholar without going through this particular piece of the program. Uh, and it's the same for the Meyerhoff program and all the other adaptation projects, right? This, this summer is really important. Um, just in the interest of time, you know, if you're familiar with the Meyerhoff elements, many of these are the same, so you will uh, be familiar with these, but it, it's pretty much the same thing, right? There's a scholarship involved, there's the summer, um, the summer program, the summer transition program, uh, advising, counseling, and other perks that are, are helpful to help the students advance through the STEM curriculum. Uh, some highlights for outcomes. So we've had nine cohorts of scholars, a total of 269 students in, uh, in general, and 91% are from underrepresented groups and or women. It's actually supposed to say or women. So. <laughs> So 91% uh, of our students are either from an underrepresented group or a woman, uh, and we've eliminated the achievement gaps for our underrepresented minority students in this program. And our scholars get higher GPAs than their counterparts. They're much more competitive for graduate programs uh, because of the, the experience that they have with the Chancellor's Science Scholar. And we also more than double the 
retention rate in a STEM major uh, as compared to the national average. And so where are they now? Uh, all sorts of amazing places. Uh, you heard from Gabby and Kyle, right? They're in top programs in their fields. Um, and that's, that's just what we did. So that is uh, all that I had to share for the Chancellor of Science Scholars Program. Uh, and I'd be happy to turn it back over to Stacy for the Q&A discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that overview of the program with us. I see folks want to clap, so go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've presented a very excellent model of what um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM looks like. And I think a lot of the questions that I have prepared are going to you know, echo that. Uh, so first up, I'd like to hear from each of our panelists um, about these four uh, core values of the program and maybe even the pillars. Um, if possible, could you mention maybe which one resonates most with you? And if you are like me and you can't make decisions, think about maybe how all four of them or maybe even the pillars work synergistically with one another to help achieve the program outcomes. So I think I'll start with the students, um, Gabby, Kyle, and then I'll toss it over to the virtual folks as well. Yeah, um, so I would say it's kind of hard to separate the four because um, I do think they work in tandem to kind of create well-rounded students, but I would say for me personally, the research experience element of it um, was probably critical to the rest of my career in terms of even getting to grad school. Um, I really never considered a career in research before I started at Carolina. Um, you know, I really love science and, and I was interested in that, but I think I was really kind of looking at it from the lens of, you know, being a physician or going to pharmacy school and really hadn't been introduced to the world of research. Um, and I think what's really nice about the program is that they get us involved in the research community at Carolina very early. Um, so I started doing research like the spring of my first year um, and really just continued throughout um, my time at Carolina, which was nice, especially applying to grad school. I had a ton of research experience, which I think really um, made me more competitive coming straight out of uh, undergrad. So I would definitely say like the research component for me was, was pretty critical. I would just, echo what Gabby said. Um, they do, all of the pillars work together synergistically um, to kind of support each other. And in my head, they all kind of get warped into one kind of pillar conglomerate, I guess. Um, but I would say that research is probably the defining pillar for myself in the Chancellor Science Scholars Program. Um, without that encouragement to pursue research at UNC, I wouldn't have gotten the undergraduate experience of researching in a lab um, and felt the passion to pursue that further in a, a graduate program at the University of Maine. Um, not only at UNC, but CSS uh, encouraged me to pursue research in the summers. So I pursued an REU at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, um, and that was also pretty vital um, to confirm that I wanted to continue in the marine sciences. Um, as well as gaining more research experience. And all the while, I had amazing support from the community aspect um, from CSS. So not only from the program coordinators and directors, but also from my peers um, and mentors who encouraged me and supported me and came to conferences and watched my very early on presentations, which were not as great as they are now. But um, yeah. Richard, maybe would you like to share from your advisory board experience? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'll echo what the students have said with regard to research. Um, research is one of the passions of my life. Uh, but I think that when students come into the laboratory, it's much more than what their experience means for the specific details of their careers in terms of using it on a resume or deciding uh, whether to do research specifically. I think having a student come into a laboratory and do research changes their worldview. I think there's a real artificiality of learning in a classroom from a textbook and doing homework problems. You don't really understand where that comes from. And to get into a laboratory 
and to see where knowledge uh, makes contact with the passion for discovery and the passion of possibility, that, that's where that experience happens for students. And, and I think it, it translates to life. Um, you take a program like the Meyerhoff program or the Chancellor Science Scholars program, uh, there was a time when that wasn't there. And for students to understand that knowledge, there's a, there's a, a, a frontier of knowledge and they need to create and exhibit leadership in moving that frontier forward. And that's what we call research. Um, when they understand that possibility within their learning and knowledge, they start seeing that possibility for everything in their life. And that the structures that are around them, there was a time when they weren't there. And it was people who looked at those structures and the frontier of those structures and said, we have to take the next step and we have to create that next step. And so the bravery that I think a student comes in into the laboratory and it, engaging in the act of discovery and creation is actually a life lesson. Uh, those are fantastic comments and I, I don't have much to add, but I, I think I'll take a slightly different tack. Um, for me, it's the community aspect of it that is probably the most salient and important part of it. I mean, the research is, is definitely, you know, essential, right? And it's the whole reason why we're doing this. Um, but I think what makes it so different from everything else that, that is going on out there is that we have this community of like just amazing, selfless people who are so humble and so just, they're the type of leader that, that, I want to follow, right? I mean, they, they're really incredible people that we're developing in this program. Um, I mean, you know, our flight was was delayed and then ultimately canceled last night. It was supposed to get in at 3 a.m. and Kyle was going to volunteer to come pick us up from the airport, right? I mean, that's the kind of people that, that we have in this program. Um, and, and so the just the, the love and the community is, is really, really incredible to see. And it doesn't, it's not confined just to the community. It really radiates out to the entire university. So when you're thinking about, you know, institutional change, you know, we don't have a lot of scholars in the program, you know, just in, in terms of raw percentage compared to the student population, right? You have like 18,000 undergrads at UNC. And as I showed you in a previous slide, about 269 of them have been Chancellor Science Scholars. That's a drop in the bucket, but their impact just ripples out so far and wide across the entire university that, you know, as a community, we have a huge impact on everything else that's going on, uh, especially when you start to think about STEM, when you start to think about DEI, um, and, you know, we have a lot of power as a very small program. Um, so that, that's, that would be my community. It's, it's really big for us. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so I do actually have a question about community, but I, I think another key part of the program is that summer accelerator program that you all have. And so maybe could everybody t talk, maybe just say a, a, a small thing about how impactful that or important that summer accelerator scholar program is. And I guess I'll pause and say for folks who aren't aware, um, in the room we have many students uh, that are grad students uh, at Brown. We also have visiting scholars from other institutions and we have postdocs, we have faculty, right? And so we have a lot of people that are within the STEM community broadly, not just at Brown. And it's not to say that, you know, what nuggets you're telling us about your very successful program can't be replicated somewhere else, right? The summer component, with or without an HHMI award, can probably be mobilized with funding. The academic component, the community, the research and academic excellence can also be replicated in other spaces. And so I think what I'd love to hear is how these components work together, particularly the summer piece to really catalyze change on campus for you all. And so again, I bias to start with the students. And so maybe we'll switch the, the order, Kyle, Gabby, and then we'll go online. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the Summer Accelerator Program was an eight-week intensive program. I think Dr. Freeman outlined it fairly well. But uh, probably the part that was most vital to me um, was going around UNC uh, and actually seeing 
the laboratories that were uh, potentially accepting students come fall. Um, I know none of them were really my interest in marine biology going in, uh, but there were plenty, and they did try to, to diversify the various topics within STEM um, in the laboratories that we saw that summer. I know several of my cohort, cohort four, um, several of the students in that cohort actually reached out to those PIs and found positions um, throughout their undergraduate careers. And that's vital to kickstarting and giving you the confidence to approach a PI um, and kind of giving us that training on how to do it, um, how to cold email a professor uh, after meeting them in person. Um, that was extremely important for me. Yeah, I definitely agree with Kyle on, on a lot of that. Um, I guess for me, this might be a little dramatic, but I would say the, the summer bridge is, is what it was called when I went through it, um, was, was quite life-changing, I think. Um, so it occurs like, you know, in that summer after you've graduated high school, you're about to go into starting your first year, and that's like a really formative time. And you're kind of thrust together with, you know, a cohort of students that you haven't met yet, you don't know. And, and um, I think kind of going through the class, the coursework, which is quite difficult um, altogether, it, I think it really prepares us to um, be successful in the school year just because, you know, we're developing study groups and um, bonding. Um, through like, you know, the diversity workshops um, and all of this. So I think for me, the Summer Accelerator program was really about building that cohort aspect, um, especially, you know, as a black woman um, and UNC is, you know, historically white institution. So, you know, I'm going into my STEM courses already, you know, maybe one of 10 black women in the room and, and you know, that can really be isolating. Um, but what was really nice about having a cohort is, you know, I had fellow black women um, and other people of color who, you know, were there and kind of understood what I was going through. And so that was also really critical um, to being successful, I think, in that atmosphere as well. Thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in here now. Um, so for me, the, the, I think one of the important things to think about and how this, this supports everything else that's going on um, you know, Kyle mentioned meeting professors and learn how to communicate with them, right? So that is two ways, right? So there's exposure um, on the other side and getting to see students who, you know, may not typically be in a lab or may not typically, you know, want to continue on through the STEM curriculum. They're seeing those students as models of success and examples of, you know, maybe, maybe their minds are changed about who they think should be in, in their labs because of their interaction with the program. Um, and so, you know, from, from our end, we're thinking about, okay, how do we leverage these interactions and these opportunities for students to engage with the faculty, um, the administration, right? So I have the students meet the chancellor. I have them meet, you know, several deans throughout the summer. Uh, so that way they're, they're getting, you know, important connections that will help them uh, progress through their careers, but also, you know, we're making sure that people who run the university are having an opportunity to interact with these students uh, and just see what the possibilities are. It's really motivational for a lot of people to interact with the program. Did you want me to answer that as yeah. well? If you have something to contribute, that's that'd be great. But if not, yeah, let, okay. me, um, let me uh, just quickly build on what Thomas pointed out and, and getting back to his first comment in talking about and emphasizing community. Um, I view part of the impact of the Chancellor Science Scholars Program as developing a community of commitment. And the way, you know, uh, the students articulated beautifully how the summer experience affects themselves. I just wanted to amplify Thomas's comment on how it affects the research group that those students come into. Um, there is nothing more exciting to a research group and to myself to see undergraduates newly come into our research group over the summer. Uh, the freshness, the excitement that they bring to the laboratory is, is transformational. And it, it's in a weird way, it's transformational every single year. 
And uh, so it's not just their personalities. And the you can just see in their eyes the opportunity and the growth that they experience, even the very first day, just walking around the laboratory, seeing the equipment, seeing the passion that the students have for the science, and seeing the community within the group to accomplish science. That science isn't, you know, an isolated white coat person in the, you know, in the back corner of a room working alone. It's a, it's a contact sport within the research group of accomplishing something as 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 a community, but. I see my students, my graduate students change. They now are, are aware of larger issues in, in the world and how they, you know, some of them very quickly get mired in the depths of their own graduate work and they start forgetting um, how much they have learned and how much impact that they have in the world for where they are right now. And so, uh, these kind, this, uh, the, the Chancellor Science Scholar Program coming in the summer uh, creates a commitment in them uh, to the work they could do right now, and, and I think it prepares them for, for a life of work. And one thing I'll add just really quickly, um, because the experiences of the folks on the stage um, were so um, Tactile, right? I mean, they were they were immersed there. They were there physically. Uh, we've also had to deal with how to, you know, get the same experience virtually. And so we we learned a lot about how to host a virtual summer program. Um, and shockingly, the cohorts that went through it also were able to form really tight bonds and build community, even though they didn't actually spend any moments at all in the same space together, same physical space. Um, and so that's you know speaks to the power of, of people desire to be connected, to have a community, um, and how important that is, you know, to carry them through, you know, once they, once they get on campus at UNC. Um, so it's, it's just really incredible to see how, how the summer transformation happens. It's only a few weeks. Um, Kyle said eight, but it's actually only five. It probably feels like 10 <laughs> because it, it is, it is really, really intensive. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the students, they just bond and connect over uh, their shared, I won't say misery, but uh, intense experience. Awesome. And I will say that this is probably my favorite time of being on campus where summer students come in and they engage in research. While I'm not in a lab myself, just seeing the excitement on people's faces, they're being in labs, they're engaging with the research. So I do. Um, I do believe that research is a very strong component of the programs, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that time as well. Um, so moving on maybe to a broader question before I open it up to the audience for uh, their questions is, you know, the NABRIC conference focuses on early career scientists, right? And so we've got two represented here. We're seeing wonderful talks by folks uh, that are here as well. So how do you think uh, programs like the Chancellor Scholars, the Millennium Scholars at Penn State, and also the Meyerhoff Scholars Program are not only changing undergraduate education, but also the next step, which is graduate education, right? And so a lot of the work that we talk about is undergraduate education, but what about the next step? Graduate education and postdoctoral education also needs change as well. So how do you think these programs are aiding in that process? And so I will toss it to maybe Thomas and Richard on, on the virtual space to comment on that, and then I'll bring it back to the, the uh, in-person space. And that's a, a really good question. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder if we have any impact at all because, right, I mean, I, I don't know, right? We haven't been doing this long enough. Um, we've, we've been around for 10 years of the program. Uh, Myra Hop has been going for over 30 years. Um, and so for them, it's clear that it's a little bit easier to see um, how they impact graduate programming. They actually have a Meyerhoff um, connected IMSD program um, that they run. And so that's that's direct impact, right? That's direct influence over something that's happening at the graduate level. Ours is a little bit more subtle, I think. Um, one, we have students who are going into graduate programs who are you know equipped with a different set of tools than uh, some of their counterparts may perhaps be equipped with in terms of being able to identify um, resources and, you know, and I'll, I'll let them speak to that more so uh, than I will speak for them. 
Um, but you know, the other thing that we do is as leaders in this these communities that we're in. I mean, it's not insular, right? We're not focused just on what's happening in our programs. Uh, we also think about other things that are going on. For example, um, I work in the chemistry department, as I mentioned before, and I recently uh, helped start a master's to a PhD bridge program um, for our chemistry department that collaborates with North Carolina Central University and HBCU that's only 11 miles down the road. Um, and so we, we just started out this year and we have our first two students um, from Central working uh, in two labs at UNC right, right now. Um, and so, you know, our just passion for this sort of work and for having impact and uh, being mentors and advisors to anyone who who wants that sort of support is an important part of, of you know, how we sort of share our knowledge and our, our resources and our expertise uh, to the broader community. Uh, I also serve as an advisor on, you know, different boards. And so, you know, all the things that I've learned over the years of working with CSS uh, have been really instrumental and helpful in the way that I have conversations about these topics, the way that I, you know, recommend and I can see, okay, well, this is what we do for the undergrads and these are the sorts of things that might be helpful to grad students and postdocs and even at the faculty level, right? And so, you know, it's, it's just a way to, to propagate that influence outside of my immediate sphere. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that very briefly. I, I, I think Thomas has stated it well, and I, I think it's it's a, a great issue for us to keep exploring and, and building upon. Um, Graduate school is a really hard time for young people. Uh, they're trying to discover and understand their own uh, personal career goals and their own personal growth. And in addition, uh, achieving great science is really hard work. So you're combining all of those things um, into one very compressed, intense period of young people's lives. Uh, most graduate students go into that period uh, without uh, strategy, strategic thinking, um, or, or, you know, true self-reflection. And so there's an enormous power for a program that's focused at the undergraduate level in instilling that kind of career thinking early on, uh, the strategic thinking about themselves and where they want to go, and, and to be making positive decisions about graduate school. Uh, that can't be underestimated. I mean, a lot of the difficulties I see graduate students have is because they just kind of fall forward into graduate school. And, and the students coming out of the Chancellor Science Scholars, you know, it's a constant uh, discussion about what graduate school is and why they're going to graduate school and, and how to prepare for that. And that's a conversation which frankly, uh, is not happening broadly in preparing most other uh, undergraduates for graduate school. So just having, you know, that kind of experience and thoughtfulness uh, as an undergraduate experience is going to set the students up for success in graduate school. Maybe I'll modify my question. So if you, if you have an answer to that, you can answer that. But I think, you know, we're often comparing ourselves to our peers. And so now you all are in a different environment than you were when you were at UNC. So maybe if you can even articulate how you feel like you're differentially prepared for graduate school based on other folks in your current graduate cohort. Am I clear on that question? So. Yeah, so I think um, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Superfine kind of touched on it a little bit, but I think these like soft skills that we learn um, in the professional development workshop are, are really beneficial. You know, how to give a good presentation, how to interview, how to make a poster, um, how to network at conferences. Like these are all things that we learn like throughout our time as a scholar, and I think really like strengthen um, our experience. I guess um, as upper undergrads and then going into grad school. Um, I also think, you know, as a graduate student at NYU, um, you take along kind of uh, the commitment to building diverse and inclusive communities, you know, to new institutions. So, I mean, 
Dr. Freeman showed the map of all the institutions that we kind of go to, and you know, there's plenty of um, DEI uh, workshops or programs at these institutions, and it's been really nice to be involved in those as well. Um, so I think it's just you know, kind of prepping us to be uh, scientists and scholars and, and champions of, of these causes and, and taking that with us, um, I think is, is a really impactful thing that the program has done. I think one of the, the pillars that I created for myself while at UNC was resiliency. And um, Dr. Stranahan actually talked about it kind of tangentially yesterday in her talk about how being a graduate student, you have to know how to pick yourself back up um, and get yourself back on the horse to keep going. Um, that was huge throughout, UN, or throughout CSS. Um, there were times where it was really hard and there were times where people wanted to quit but having that sense of community and learning how to build a community for yourself wherever you go um, was super important because that, those are the people that are gonna pick you back up and give you that encouragement to keep on going. So in that way, I think CSS prepared me um, kind of more so than other graduate students within my cohort to have that sort of resiliency um, to keep going in my research and my program now. Awesome. All right, thank you all for sharing and responding to the questions. Um, and so let's give them a round of applause again for their contribution. And so with our remaining time, I'd like to open up to questions from the audience. Again, this is not a Brown or UNC specific conversation, but rather how us as researchers and scientists within the community uh, can also replicate change on our campuses. So I please, there are no questions that are too, uh, small for this space. Uh, thank you all for, for those points and for those presentations. It was very informative and also very inspirational. You know, It's great to see the success in, in building these initiatives. And hopefully, um, I can learn more about the best way to, to set that up locally. So I actually have two questions. The first one is, um, at the beginning, you mentioned the importance of having an, institute, an institution's actions match its values um, and put some action behind the words. So I'm curious, when an institution's actions are not matching its stated values, what are some strategies to point this out without alienating or offending uh, university leadership? And uh, the second question pertains to how to run a successful targeted recruitment for uh, junior faculty from diverse backgrounds. That's, those are, are great, great questions. Um, and I'll, I'll tackle the first part of the first, or the first question. Um, because we've, we've had this experience, right? I mean, I don't know uh, how many in the audience are familiar with uh, the fact that we had a Confederate monument on our campus that had been there for you know well over a hundred years, um, but you know that was really a, a lightning rod, um, you know, especially after you know a, a lot of different things were, were happening um, at the same time. But you know, the students ultimately are the people who can tug at the strings of the administrators without without you know causing any problems. Um, and not that I'm saying that, like, okay, well, you know, us adults shouldn't say anything and then just let the, the kids, like, do whatever. No, it's, it's not that. It's that when the students are upset by something, um, right, as a community, they will bring up that issue and they feel comfortable with us and they will say, hey, this is a problem. We don't like this. Um, what can we do about it? And so we try to teach them constructive ways to have conversations, right? So. It begins with that summer program where we have the communication and debate course, right? So they learn how to construct arguments. And so they're like, okay, well, what, what's one thing that we can do? We have a conversation. And then they decide, okay, well, let's write a letter. And so, okay, somebody takes point on that, right? We, we try to help them develop their skills as leaders. Um, and they start to, you know, do things like write letters or they will, you know, reach out with an email or something like that. Um, and in this particular case with Silent Sam, is the the name of the, the statue. Um, students started to write a letter. The staff helped to uh, edit the letter. And then we got signatures from everyone um, in our immediate community who, who 
who felt the same, who agreed with the letter. No scholars were required to sign it. We weren't trying to say that anyone had to feel a particular type of way about this, this particular situation. Um, but we supported the scholars' desires to, you know, feel more comfortable in the space they were in. Um, and so, you know, it was the simplest of writing a really impassioned and direct letter holding the chancellor at the time accountable um, for what we felt was a, a bad decision about what was going to happen with the statute. Um, which is the only right decision, of course, is to remove it. And so we said as much. Um, and it didn't it didn't cause any alienation to write this letter. Um, because when you get to meet the students, you love them. And, and so, you know, it's not, like you, the, the administrators aren't going to feel alienated if they have any sort of connection and commitment to the program or any, you know, part of a program that's like this. Um, and so, you know, get the students involved. I mean, you know, Freeman Rabowski will tell the story about being uh, in the, the civil rights marches in Alabama uh, as a child, right? Because it's something, something is different when there are young people involved in these issues directly and you see how they're affected. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the counter of what uh, Rich was describing about how, how invigorating and exciting and, 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 you know, it, it is to have the, these, this young energy in, in these spaces. Uh, on the opposite end, when you see something affecting them, it tugs at you a little bit differently than it does when you know it's just some other faculty. Um, and so, let the students be involved in that process because it's their community, it's their university, and if these issues affect them, then they should be a part of it too. Uh, <clears throat> those were really excellent questions um, and really hard questions. Uh, building on what Thomas said, um, starting with the first issue of how do you advocate effectively within administration? Um, I think uh, I, I advocate all the time for, for example, for my department and uh, other initiatives. And what I have found is uh, there's two kinds of language in talking with administrative structures. Um, there's pain and there's opportunity. And uh, I always use opportunity language. I'm very like positive, forward looking. This is going to be great. Um, but the administration often only responds or responds most to pain. What's going to happen if we don't do this? Um, and so learning that framing is actually important. Uh, it's not my natural language, but I've learned to use it. The other part of pain for, for administration is they're very risk averse. Um, they, they don't want to see failure. And uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's less important for them to have a success than it is for them to not have a failure. And so, uh, I think bringing that around to how you advocate, I think you begin by bringing in a successful model. And uh, that is the power of the Meyerhoff program and the other programs across the country is you bring those people to campus for a conversation about why it succeeded where it is and how it, and, and to generate that commitment within the administration for what could happen to your institution. I think, you know, issues of commitment in my mind always come from community and personal contact, getting people to look at each other and, uh, and understand their passion and having the administration look at people and, and say, yes, let's take the next step. Um, I think the other issue with that is administrators are always gonna be concerned about money. And, uh, and, and so that's part of the conversation is to say, you know, what are you concerned about, you know, individually with administrator and what, you know, why are, why shouldn't we go forward with this? What's your concern? And, and part of that will always be money. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the fields are ripe right now for funding for DEI initiatives. And so perhaps part of like getting it started with an initial investment it's to uh, gain access to the development um, office and the development community for the institution to start being able to have that conversation 
to see what it means to start raising money uh, for the initiative. Um, so turning now to faculty, uh, uh, I've been chair for the last five years of my department, and I've seen um, a, a, a lot of work attempted within UNC to diversify the faculty. And I have to say it is really hard. And, and the reason I say it's hard is because yet in the end, uh, it's the inclusivity that I think is the hardest part. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's more straightforward that you could just hire an underrepresented minority. Um, and you could set aside positions for that. Um, I, I think that that does not get at the deeper issue of inclusivity within the university uh, for underrepresented minorities. And um, it means that the initial effort of bringing somebody in, I, I think will ultimately fail. And so uh, the work has to be done within the faculty um, to understand issues of diversity and the benefits that brings to the scholarly community. Um, and uh, the work has to be done for the individual you're bringing in. Uh, faculty searches within departments um, uh, are often targeted in, in a scholarly sense. We want somebody in this field. We want somebody in that field. Uh, we need to fill in this piece of the intellectual landscape of the department. Um, the narrower uh, faculty searches are uh, by scholarship, uh, the less diverse the pool is going to be. So, so that means you need to uh, open up the pool. Uh, you open up the, the range of scholarship. And I've seen this happen at UNC. So, you, it, and I think that's the right step. Um, but then you bring somebody in who uh, maybe doesn't have a natural community within that department or the university. And so they're, they end up kind of being an outlier. And so, okay, you've solved a diversity step, um, but you haven't solved the inclusivity set. And, and so the commitment is not just bringing that one person in, but the, the commitment is to their success. And, and so you bring a person in and they're, you recognize early on and you do the work of understanding this, that they're an outlier from their scholarship. Um, and that means you have to commit more positions within the area that you brought them in for so that they have a community of scholarship um, uh, around them for their scholarly success. And, and so it's a complicated uh, question and we have to keep really thinking hard about it and learning lessons every time it doesn't work um, to get it right. And I'm not sure anybody is really getting it right. I think we're all taking steps forward uh, there's a lot of details and a lot of hard work to really getting at that last step, which is the inclusivity um, for bringing somebody in that the department is ready and that the uh, the whole community, the university is ready to support this person. Yep. Next question. Uh, hi. hi. Um, first off, thank you. I, I really enjoyed uh, all the discussion and the presentations. And then I have a broader question that I, I will try to articulate it first to try to explain what, what I mean. So for us, sometimes, like underrepresented minorities, when we get to grad school, we are like another number, like increasing diversity and so on and so forth. But then it's the thing about retention and what it is expected from us from a behavioral point of view. Sometimes we are like we want to be ourselves and to bring all our our thinking and all our other things to but then we are expect to behave in a way that it's it's not natural to us and we are sometimes being taught to behave in that in that way to survive but that doesn't like or, or to thrive let's call it another way to thrive in this in this field you need to have certain social abilities and sometimes are not uh, in consonance with our uprising or, or, or actually the way we want to live, right? Like we want to be like outspoken. We want to be happy. We want to be able to dance in love if we have a, a great result, right? Like my first thing is like, oh yes, and I will be like start dancing. Or that's not expected. That, that's, that's not what it is expected from me, right? Like I should be like this quiet, nice person that doesn't shout, doesn't say. So 
My question is, we can learn how to behave, to thrive, <laughs> but is it worth it to do it in that way? And second, what can we do or how can we address the community, the, the integration, like this is something I, I think it resonated when, when, when Richard was talking, like how can we uh, integrate people? How can we diversify our community, but also like make like more inclusive in that in that sense? I'm not sure how to explain it better than like, giving examples because it's I might not have the words in English for what I'm trying to say. Um, and and I also think that's that that goes with retention, right? And the same for 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 faculties. I guess like we get some faculties, but then they don't feel that they belong. They, have, they, they are always feeling they don't belong there. So how can we not, not only maybe wait two or three years to bring more people, but how can we now today start changing those things and building a more inclusive community in general? I, I think that's, again, it's a great question. And I think that uh, um, Growing hearts, making hearts bigger in our community is really hard. Um, it takes a long time. And when you talk about a laboratory culture, uh, you talk about uh, professors. Um, the professorate is dominated by old white men. And, uh, and teaching old people to grow their hearts is just really hard. Um, so the advice I would give is uh, you, in a sense, think of yourself as interviewing research laboratories. Um, when you're thinking about which laboratories to join, talk to the graduate students. And you'll get a sense in talking with the graduate students what that culture is like. Um, go to group meetings for the laboratory. See how the people talk to each other. See uh, what respect the, um, the principal investigator confers to the students and the agency that uh, they give the students. And in the end, that's, you know, finding the right culture that matches you is, is what's going to set you up for, for success. I mean, I, I had a problem as a white man in, in early finding a research group because I saw research advisors that were jerks. And I couldn't, you know, I found... Uh, you know, people culturally who look like me, but personality wise, um, uh, they didn't resonate with me. So I had to look around and find a research group that had a spring in its step that kind of matched the joy that I wanted to bring to research. So I think it's a common problem. And uh, I think the best idea is to talk to the students in the group and get to get to the, um, the group meetings, because changing the culture of that research group is just really hard. It's really hard. Yeah, I just had a small thing to add. I don't really know if I have advice, but I relate very heavily with this. It's kind of like this idea of code switching, right? You know, And I feel like it does impact the, the work that we can do when we're kind of hiding a small but big portion of, of our personalities. Um, I would say like, you know, even at NYU, I think just being like relentless in, in you know, the needs of, of the people of color um, in our grad school, like, you know, just talking to the director of the grad program saying, you know, we really want to have a retreat where we just kind of have a time for students to um, discuss different topics like inclusion or, um, you know, so I think creating spaces within the grad school has been really helpful for us and, and, and just being relentless with um, the admin um, at all levels um, has been helpful, so yeah. And can I add to, to your question? What I hear you say is that, you know, what we're doing is um, we're bringing, we, we create programs to welcome diverse students into our spaces, but the spaces don't actually change themselves, right? And I think that what we really need to do is focus less on bringing in students who look different and are different and actually focus on changing the culture to create sustainable change, right? Like it's not about bringing people in and hoping it'll change, but it's actually taking the steps to make meaningful lasting change so people can feel like they belong because they actually do belong, right? So I hear your question. I don't have an answer for that, but I know that there are people who are, uh, to uh, Freeman's point, uh, Thomas's point, you know, excited to think about what that looks like and create a better future for everybody who wants to participate in science. 
I see we have lots of questions in the back, so Christy. Thank you for the panel. This was a really wonderful chance to learn about your program. I actually have a more logistical question. We've been thinking a lot about how to make uh, access to working in a lab during the semester more equitable and achievable for all undergraduate students. Frequently it requires unpaid effort and people are balancing this with like work study commitments and so I was curious how the undergrads in your program fit research in during the semester. Do they get course credit? Is there enough financial support from your program to enable this? And how can we make undergraduate research during the semester, which is so important to then help you get in for the summer, uh, more accessible? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a mix of both. Um, and the program doesn't directly support students doing research uh, during the academic year financially. Um, most of the students will either take, uh, receive a course credit um, or their own work study, or the lab will have funds and, and they'll support the students directly with, um, with those funds. Uh, as, a, as a research assistant. Um, and that's just typically what we do. In the summers, it's different. We have uh, some resources to help support students with up to uh, around $5,000 uh, if they want to do research somewhere. Uh, it could be anywhere, but as, as long as they don't have um, enough funds to support themselves during the summer, we'll, we'll help, help them out. Um, so those are the ways that we directly support research. Um, the other thing that we have going on at UNC, and this is, you know, thinking about the broader institution and, and access to research, is that we have these courses now that are um, meant to give students legitimate, you know, authentic research experiences, and they're cure courses. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but these are course-based undergrad research experiences uh, where students, you know, they'll take a course in a semester and then they'll the, the at least some portion of the lab, if not the entire thing, will be focused on uh, having the students engage in a, in a research project, right? Where you're not doing the, the typical cookbook lab. Um, and so if, if the institution can't support a program like this, and or if there are not enough spaces for students, um, a cure is another alternative to go to get students a, a real research experience, where they actually try to work on a, a real scientific problem that, um, that they get to discover something new. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the, the issue of, uh, again, and a great question, the, um, the funding of the students, I think, is really important. Um, and it's, uh, so I think the, the answer to that is in part that everybody who has a research grant on campus, all the PIs, um, can have conversations with their program officers about supplements for those grants. And uh, some of those opportunities are explicit, for example, National Science Foundation or NIH. Um, a lot of those opportunities are, are uh, greased with a, a conversation with the program officer. Um, but I think in the end, the faculty uh, needs support in pursuing uh, those funding opportunities. And so, uh, you know, the formats for those supplements are often um, pretty standardized and are, are not hard to implement, but fighting through and, and understanding the process can be just, you know, a barrier and any barrier slows things down. So we, we have not uh, solved this at UNC yet, but one of the things I want to do is to have our, uh, our research services office actually be proactive in uh, identifying centrally uh, all the uh, National Science Foundation research grants, all the NIH research grants, and then specifically contacting uh, the uh, principal investigators um, with a template for how to apply for those uh, supplements to, to support students. Um, and uh, so I think there's things that the institutions can do to uh, get access to the, those incremental dollars, which means so much to the experience of the students. And I'd be happy offline to talk more about this. Stacy, do we have time for one more? We are cutting into the poster session, so I do think it wouldn't be fair, but I, I, I'll, we'll take one more. Um, thank you all so much for this panel. Like it's been, I feel like the word inspiring sounds kind of trite, but it is truly inspiring to know that um, you know these schemes are out there and they work. 
Um, I guess my question is, um, well, you know, one of the things that I, f I found uh, most important about the talk was the emphasis on community, particularly between students. Um, and I guess my question is sort of, in the context of the pandemic for the last two years, um, what sort of strategies have you, have you all found useful for helping build that community um, when it's very difficult to physically meet? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and since I'm the one who probably has the most experience with doing that with the program, uh, I'll take that. So uh, for the summer accelerator program, um, typically we help students that can't use cell phones at all. Um, and they are like banned from social media. So right, it's, it's meant to have them uh, sit there together and interact with each other and build bonds that way. Uh, well, that's impossible to monitor at all while students are, you know, in their, you know, 20 something different homes. Um, and so we just flipped it around and we <laughs> embraced it. Um, don't be mad, Gabby. Uh, but we did let the students not necessarily use uh, the typical social media platforms, but they, they got to connect with each other virtually um, in a few different ways um, using, using different tools. And so they started different like group chats and um, sometimes they would go and uh, someone would host a movie online and they would all stream it together. Um, and so, you know, they would do things like that. And then we have, you know, these different opportunities for them to have their just their own online time to talk to each other without necessarily having the, uh, any of the adults present. And so we, we try to do things like that and just give them some time and space. Um, and then eventually uh, some of the students organized like a meetup where they would, they just met somewhere randomly, not everyone could participate, but at least a, a number of them could get together. And that was just something that they spontaneously did on their own. And so they they were proactive in finding their own ways to build community because they you know, we created a space for them to do it um, and, and the motivation and intention that that's something that they should do and then they just went for it. Uh, so a lot of, I mean, you, you don't necessarily have to do a lot. The students will, will take care of a lot of that for you because they, they want that just as much as you do. Maybe I can add that this is a major topic for the afternoon panel, so we can mm -hmm. continue the discussion during the afternoon panel. Yeah. All right, thanks again to our panelists, both in person and virtual, for this wonderful uh, uh, sharing of your expertise. I truly appreciate it. Um, and I guess we'll transition to the poster session afterwards. Thank you.